So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our BCSS Members Only event. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you. If you don't know me, my name is Phaedra Aldridge, and I am the CEO of the BC Schizophrenia Society. And I would like to start by acknowledging that we are very grateful to be virtually gathered on Indigenous land. From our offices in Vancouver, I am grateful to be on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. Thank you for being a member of BCSS. By becoming a BCSS member, you are helping to make us stronger. A strong membership gives us a louder voice on matters of importance to families who have been affected by schizophrenia and other severe and persistent mental illnesses. Now, there are many benefits to being a BCSS member. As a member, you have access to exclusive events, the opportunity to vote at our AGM, which will be on October 21st this year, as well as a chance to share experiences on the BCSS website, through our podcast, and of course, through all of our social media channels. Because you are a member, you probably know that BCSS is a long-standing nonprofit organization. In fact, we've been around for 41 years now. And one thing has remained consistent throughout all of these years. BCSS provides education and support to families across the entire province impacted by schizophrenia and other severe and persistent mental illnesses. Our reach is throughout the province and we have a very specific focus on rural and underserved areas. We work closely with psychiatrists, researchers and medical teams. Schizophrenia, as we all know, is a very serious mental illness. One out of 100 people have this illness and three out of 100 experience psychosis. And unfortunately, there's still a tremendous amount of stigma and many myths that surround this illness. And now one of the main goals of BCSS is to create awareness about severe and persistent mental illnesses such as schizophrenia and the effects that it has both on the individual that has the illness, but also on the family members caring and loving that individual with the illness. And we have been able to increase awareness about this illness in a variety of ways. And thanks to our partnership with the provincial government and all of our other partners, we now have more staff in rural and underserved areas, additional support to support our younger generation through our kids and teens and tweens programs. We have additional family support programs. We have our Strengthening Families Together, also known as SFT. And we have our podcasts and events just like this one. We have worked very hard to strengthen relationships within the community because we know we cannot do this alone, both with ministries, health authorities, and community partners. In order to have change, we must work together. We cannot do this alone. We have come a long way, but we still have a long way to go when it comes to educating people, supporting those dealing with the illness, and helping to create change within our province. We need everybody to make this happen. And we have to continue working together to build a province where those affected by schizophrenia and other severe and persistent mental illnesses receive effective treatment and support. And a province where our families are recognized an essential partner within the mental health system. And tonight we get to hear from Dr. Richard O'Reilly, who will share his view of the services and treatments available for people living with a serious mental illness in Canada. And after his presentation, we will have lots of time for a Q&A session. And we really do want to hear from you. So please make sure that you put your question in the Q&A button just at the bottom of your screen so we can keep track of them. And I also have to give a huge shout out tonight to AA Pharma. AA Pharma, thank you for your ongoing support. AA Pharma is the sponsor of tonight's event. And now we're going to watch a short video from our sponsor. Hello, my name is Ryan Unwin and I am the Director of Sales and Marketing at AA Pharma. I am humbled and honored to be addressing each of you today and wish each of you a warm welcome from wherever you're watching. On behalf of AA Pharma, thank you for joining us for the BCSS Members Only event, The Mental Health System and How We Can Fix It, with special guest, Dr. Richard O'Reilly. 
Events such as today's are tremendously important with the goal to help individuals living with and for family members who are loving and caring for somebody with mental illness to help them navigate the road to recovery through awareness, education, and reducing stigma. AA Pharma is proud to support the BC Schizophrenia Society in its commitment and initiatives to provide all BC residents with community, innovative services, and outstanding advocacy support. For myself, this is truly the type of work that makes the biggest difference. We value our work together with the BCSS, whose values and objectives align closely with our own, in the sharing of ideas and insights, and again, with the goal to provide ways of achieving meaningful change for the individuals and families we serve. Thank you again for the opportunity to support BCSS and tonight's event, and have a great night. And thank you, AA Pharma. Thank you very much, Ryan, for, for talking tonight, for speaking with us tonight, and a big shout out to Michelle as well. Thank you to you both. And now I would like to introduce you to, to our speaker of tonight's event. Dr. Richard O'Reilly is a professor of psychiatry at the Northern School, Ontario School of Medicine. He also obtained his medical degree in Dublin. Dr. O'Reilly has a specialist qualification in psychiatry from the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the United Kingdom, as well as from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons here in Canada. Dr. O'Reilly works in the Therapeutic Brain Stimulation Clinic at the Parkwood Institute, and his research interests are the genetics of schizophrenia, as well as mental health law. Dr. O'Reilly, thank you so much for being here tonight. Welcome to the event. Thank you uh, very much. It's, it's actually uh, my pleasure. Sorry, it's a little, getting a little dark in Ontario. And uh, I'm going to throw a little light on myself. It's, it's actually a great honour for me to be invited uh, to speak at the um, British Columbia Schizophrenia Society. Um, Ms. Aldrich has uh, highlighted some of the things that the uh, BCSS does in the province of British Columbia, but um, I have to tell you that uh, the BCSS is a shining light across Canada and particularly in, in Ontario, where our own uh, Schizophrenia Society, the Schizophrenia Society of Ontario, um, um, imploded, uh, has disappeared, uh, leaving a huge vacuum for family members here. And uh, many uh, family members I know turn to, turn westwards uh, to British Columbia to get guidance uh, from your organization. Uh, so for that reason, it, it really is a um, honor for me to have the opportunity to speak uh, uh, to the organization tonight. So let me just share my screen. Okay, that should be good. Um, the, so it, actually, this is the title of my talk. The system is broken. How can we fix it? Um, somehow uh, in the distance between Ontario and British Columbia, uh, something went astray somehow and the uh, title changed. But I deliberately chose this provocative, challenging title because we are facing major challenges in providing um, appropriate quality healthcare for individuals who have schizophrenia and other psychosis. Um, so my intention tonight is to present a relatively short uh, presentation uh, I'm going to use the Socratic me method of asking questions to try to clarify where we are, why we're here, and what, if anything, we can we can do about it. Um, I know some people might prefer a longer didactic presentation, um, and um, if you do, that's uh, available uh, on the internet. If you just Google Richard O'Reilly, Richmond Hill, or Richard O'Reilly Families you'll come across a video of my presentation uh, approximately 18 months ago in, uh, in Richmond Hill, uh, which is a, it's a longer version of what I'm going to say today, but with more practical events and uh, practical, practical um, recommendations and suggestions. So how can we fix the system? So, one thing I'm going to ask you is, should we clone Susan Inman? Um, 
because I know Susan Inman well, and it uh, gives me a chance to give her a shout out. Um, she is very well known uh, in British Columbia, but also across Canada and the United States, a tireless worker uh, writing on her blogs and writing for the Huffington Post uh, and other publications, uh, and someone who knows more than I do about a number of aspects of schizophrenia treatment, such as cognitive uh, remediation, and, and also issues around peer support and psychoeducation. So yes, uh, this, uh, this ridiculous suggestion gives me a chance to give a shout out to Ms. Inman, but I'm actually going to come back to it in a slightly more serious uh, manner at the end of the uh, presentation. This is the this is a web link, and uh, I will provide it to the organisation. But uh, this this gets to the presentation I give at uh, Richmond Hill. But uh, again, if you Google Richard O'Reilly families, I think top of the uh, uh, top of the uh, uh, click ons or Google results is that uh, video for that presentation. So in considering. Uh, this question, I think I really have to be asked, is the system really broken? And one of the things I want to say to you is that one of the few advantages of getting older is that you're by necessity have been around a long time and you see the changes in the system. And when I started psychiatry, it was really easy to get an admission, not just for psychosis. The idea that somebody in an acute psychotic breakdown wouldn't be admitted to a, a psychiatric ward was just unthinkable. Uh, in fact, when I started to practice in, in Ontario, I was able to call any of my colleagues uh, from an outpatient clinic I, I ran and they would admit patients that was an eating disorder, I would uh, uh, call a colleague who had an interest in eating disorders and he or she would admit the patient. Similarly, what, uh, if it was depression, that was very easy. And the only question that asked me that say, Richard, are you gonna take the patient back when we discharge the patient? I'd say, of course, and we'd get the person in. Now, as I'm sure a number of you listening tonight know, you can't obtain an admission when it's necessary. You bring your loved one to the hospital, there are no beds, it's backed up, people stay in the emergency room for 48, 72 hours. And of course, in that situation, the clinicians like me are under tremendous pressure to send people home, not to admit them. So now we have a situation where people coming in with very severe psychotic episodes will not be admitted. Um, especially if they've got family at home looking after them, people say, well, you take them back. Uh, and even if they're entirely disruptive or people are up all night, et cetera, they, they aren't admitted. Um, I, I'm interested to hear in the question and answer and uh, comments, uh, if that happens in British uh, Columbia, I'm fairly sure it does. It certainly is happening in Ontario. And if you do get somebody into hospital, the admissions are too short to allow full uh, resolution of uh, psychosis, let alone the development of a, uh, of a discharge plan. So it's not uncommon in Ontario for individuals to be admitted with a psychotic illness, to be admitted for um, six to nine days and then discharged. Uh, in the United States, I know admissions are take an average of six days. But in that time, I can tell you from working all my life in inpatient care, you spend the first three or four days trying to gather data, figure out what's happened, hopefully talking to uh, family members where, there are, uh, where they are available. Um, takes two weeks for any psychotic medication to have a significant effect. And of course, you know, you need to spend a lot of time working uh, with community agencies, family members, friends, the person themselves, to try to get a discharge plan. 
And the failure to do that, the short duration of psychiatric admissions, means that people are increasingly discharged to homelessness. They go to the shelters or they're just released and left to their own devices. In the early part of the millennium, in the, you know, 2002 to 2003, this was almost unheard of in London, Ontario, where I work. By 2006, 2007, we were discharging from my hospital 200 patients a year to homelessness. And this was brought to light by um, Dr. Cheryl Forchuk, who is a uh, nurse, uh, PhD nurse researcher in London, Ontario. And it caused quite a flap initially uh, uh, and some effort by the hospital to correct that. But as his years gone by, gone by, our bed numbers have shrunk. We've moved to a very nice new facility, but there are only a quarter the number of beds that there were in 2000. And so we are regularly discharging to homeless. Um, I, I don't know what people are thinking as I say this. Maybe they're thinking, oh, well, that's that's OK. That's normal. That's what happens. Don't you know, Dr. Riley? But this is totally, totally inappropriate. Many severe mentally ill uh, patients at the end of a uh, uh, admission, let's say it's eight days, they've been put on an antipsychotic medication, maybe a more complex regime with an antidepressant and a hypnotic at night. They're sent back to their family physician with no community follow-up. So these are the, these are the the most severe cases in psych psych psychiatry, and we don't provide any ongoing community treatments. How could that be? That's totally ridiculous, outrageous. Um, we should not stand for that. Not, not, not happening once, but it's happening all the time. Family doctors continually complain to me about it. Now, to be fair, family doctors complain about a number of other things, uh, such as not getting a psychiatric consult for an anxiety disorder. But again, these are the most severely affected individuals in our system. And we should provide ongoing care after an acute hospitalization. Fortunate patients may have the supports of, the fa of families. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like uh, caregivers who no doubt are um, on the webinar tonight. But I think a lot of you will have had the experience of your relative being treated in hospital uh, or perhaps by a community. Uh, clinician and not getting any information about what's happening. Even though you're providing intense care and monitoring at home. Um, and this again is, is totally unacceptable. Um, British Columbia may be, may be different than Ontario. I know that your uh, mental health legislation and privacy legislation is more respectful of the uh, role that family members uh, uh, play. But I still think and I'd be interested to hear after the presentation that people have had this experience. Uh, so again, what I'm saying, family members are often not given essential information that they need to provide uh, safe care, uh, support and monitoring of their ill relative. Okay, so is a solution just around the corner? You know, I, I am an optimist. Um, I do believe that uh, parts of the system can be improved. However, I really see myself as a realist. Um, and as a realist, I have to say something to you that you're not gonna wanna hear. I see no reason that the system will not continue to deteriorate. So as we stand today, I think in two and probably five years, things are likely to be worse than they are at the moment. Um, you may be, again, I say horrified to hear me say that, but my job is not to give you a sugar-coated pill. 
things have been progressively deteriorating over the almost 40 years now I've worked in uh, in Canada. And there's there's nothing to suggest that they're going to get better. Over the years, I, I, I will say that there have been certainly in Ontario two big improvements in the system. Uh, and those are the, the development of assertive community treatment teams and the development of first episode programs for psychosis. But those advances have been far overshadowed by the deterioration in general care um, and the particularly the inability to get a bed or to get long-term follow-up in the community for people who are not uh, in the first episode program. So how can we fix the system? Well, I think we have to ask yourself the question, why is it broken? Why is the system not working? Maybe, maybe a more accurate question is, why is the system not fixed already? So if we know and have known for years that really bad things are happening, such as discharge to homelessness, how come that hasn't been corrected? We've had, I think, uh, now almost 20 years, certainly 15 years to correct that but it's actually getting worse, not better. Oops, that's the wrong button. So um, as a psychiatrist, I, I couldn't help putting in this quote. It's uh, actually, I think, attributed to Albert Einstein. Um, the first sign of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, getting a, expecting a different result. Um, maybe, it's uh, uh, a bit of a verbal a parabola, but uh, I would say it's it's the first sign of or a sign of stupidity, stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting things to be different, and that's what we're doing in Ontario. We have had commission after commission, report after report, looking at the problems with the mental health system, and the problems get worse. Um, the, the solutions are generally the same. Um, the, typically, people say that we should spend more money, uh, which I think might help, but it's not going to address the problems that I laid out, listed out in that slide, looking at the difficulties in the system. So throwing money at a problem is a blunt solution. Uh, I think we need to really look at what are the key problems in our system and then try to fix those. Some of you may be surprised to hear me say this because you may have seen the, the movie, uh, sorry, documentary, Insanity. And I was interviewed in that uh, uh, documentary. And one of the things I said was that I thought that mental health budgets should be increased to 10% from our current 7%, actually slightly less. Uh, of the total healthcare budget to 10%. And that would be in keeping with uh, other European countries. However, unfortunately, um, I, the part where I said in the uh, interview, the, the videotaped interview, where that money should be spent was left out because the money shouldn't just be into the general mental health coffers, but it should focus on people with severe and persistent mental illness because they are the most seriously ill and they are not getting appropriate treatment at the moment. So money may bring some benefits and a trickle down effect, but will not uh, address those woeful failures. So that brings me back to the question that I originally posed. So why are these feelings not already fixed? Maybe um, we need to ask, what is it that's really broken? What is it that's stopped um, um, progressive approach to looking after individuals with severe and persistent mental illness? Well, I would say, uh, posit that the problem is that we don't prioritize services for the most seriously mentally ill individuals. 
why do mental health services not do what the rest of medicine does? So in respiratory medicine, for example, we don't prioritize treatment for somebody who presents with a cough, who doesn't have any underlying pathology, cancer or say, pneumonia, et cetera. They've got an irritating cough. That, might, that can be very irritating. We need to see what we can do. But a person presenting with acute, uh, an acute asthma attack will get prior priority treatment. If they're an adolescent, they may be in acute respiratory uh, um, distress, they'll be admitted to hospital, they'll be treated aggressively. Um, and when they're discharged from hospital, because that's such a serious problem, They'll get follow up by a respirologist uh, who will make sure that the family physician has all the knowledge and tools to prevent that happening again or reduce the frequency of further acute asthma attacks. But in mental health, money is going willy nilly. People who have got anxiety disorders or relationship problems uh, or difficulties in, with their parents will we get equal access, in fact, sometimes more access and easier access to treatment. Is the problem in the question I pose, mental health services? Certainly, it doesn't focus the attention on what's happening to people with severe and persistent mental illness. Um, and it leaves the public confused about what the difference is. I, I honestly, I think many members of the public don't uh, understand that psychosis is a severe illness uh, that needs constant monitoring and treatment at times, needs hospitalization, may needs at times treatment that's provided over objection. Um, Mental health services sounds like it's well-being, that it's you go to a spa and maybe somebody will improve your overall health. Um, so I think that's problematic. Now, this is the point in the lecture where if I was in a university facing a, a class of students, medical students say, I would be wise and it would be advised to give what's called a trigger warning. So the next point I'm going to put on the screen is going to be quite upsetting to some members of this uh, audience. So I'm just giving you uh, a warning, a trigger warning, as they call it. Uh, members of the British Columbia uh, Schizophrenia Society, I'm sad to tell you that nobody really cares about people with severe mental illness. Actually, I do walk it back because uh, that's not true. And I know it's not true, even though I put it up there as a bit of a shocker. Some people care, you care, and many, many other uh, family members care. Um, many of my colleagues care. Uh, I was uh, talking briefly with some of the organizers before the start of this meeting, and uh, uh, I know many excellent caring psychiatrists in uh, British Columbia. Uh, two, the two bills, as I call them, are come to mind immediate, immediately. Bill Owner and uh, Bill McEwen, excellent, and there are many, many others, um, and there are many nurses and social workers who do care. However, as organisations, psychiatric associations are made up by psychiatrists who do all sorts of uh, work: child psychiatry, look after addictions, look after people with uh, mood disorders, anxiety disorders. Many of my colleagues uh, just see people for counselling, see people on a weekly basis for counselling, don't see any uh, people in hospitals or community-based clinics. So when it comes to organised psychiatry, organisations like the Canadian Psychiatric Association or the, um, I'll, I'll use the, the Ontario Psychiatric Association or in the BC, Psychiatric Association, there are conflicting issues. And that prevents, uh, in my experience, has prevented repeatedly psychiatry 
stepping forward, organized psychiatry to demand changes in hospital systems and in funding that would solve the problems that I have listed earlier. So what can we do? Um, you know, actually, I've skipped over one thing, so I'm just going to go back. Um, so, yeah, organized professional bodies are not likely to really take the bull by the horn and advocate for people with severe and persistent mental illness. Some individuals will definitely do that, uh, but you can't rely on psychiatry. Another problem that we have, and my colleagues have, and again, I've alluded to it, but I'm going to emphasize it is that in when the system is under resourced and somebody your relative comes to the emergency room it's exceedingly difficult for me to insist that that person is admitted if we have 30 people um, boarding in the emergency room and no beds or no uh, discharges ups upstairs and the solution of course what happens in these situations is the hospital administration approached me and said, Dr. Riley, you've got uh, five patients, uh, inpatient, and we have uh, 30 people in the emergency room. Can you discharge two patients? And sometimes, yes, I discharge patients before I believe that they are ready to, uh, to go back to the community. The other individuals that claim to speak for the uh, severe and persistent mental illness are uh, people in various consumer groups. Um, and this again is problematic. Um, there, we sometimes do come across uh, individuals with severe and persistent mental illness that can lobby, uh, can work and uh, be advocates, but there is a real intrinsic problem in that the more severe the illness, the less the individual can do this uh, work for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, impaired motivation is sometimes the problem, impaired cognitive uh, abilities, lack of insight, of course, uh, into the nature of the, uh, of the illness. And something I've seen repeatedly where, uh, where people have had those abilities uh, difficulty and breakdown uh, with stress and stress sometimes involved in the actual advocacy itself. Unfortunately, the people who step into the void, uh, who say I've lived experience, typically are people with less severe illness. And sometimes they actually advocate for things that are, that are a, the exact opposite of what individuals with severe and persistent mental illness need. So sometimes so-called advocates, patient advocates, are advocating for the um, ending of involuntary hospitalization, which is life-saving for some people with severe and persistent mental illness. So what can we do? Well, my proposal is that the people who do care the most about uh, individuals with uh, severe mental illness, that is family members, family caregivers, must take part, must be given the part in the design of the system and overseeing how the system functions. So it's a critical thing. I think that families have been sidelined side for far too long. It's time to change that. Which brings me back to my original question. Do we clone Susan Inman? Because Susan Inman has done many things. Uh, and if we had two Susan Inmans, presumably she could do many more things. She could write more articles. She could uh, become an expert in other areas of uh, schizophrenia care. She could uh, organize perhaps other uh, groups across the country, bring her uh, knowledge and expertise. And goodness, if we free Susan Inmans, she could uh, do this uh, perhaps through the United States as well as here. She could uh, uh, lobby politicians. I don't know what we'd 
could do with four suited minimums, but it would be wonderful. Unfortunately, it's not possible to clone suited minimum. And I have to tell you just for a laugh that actually to make this slide took me about 35 minutes, uh, much longer than I, I uh, uh, thought necessary. I thought it was going to be really easy, but just to have four pictures of Susan Hinman line up and come onto the screen when I wanted uh, was uh, nearly impossible. So, of course, to clone somebody is uh, ridiculous. But I want to make the point that uh, if we can't clone Susan in Inman, then people in British Columbia and across Canada can't expect Miss Inman to do everything. And other individuals need to step forward. And I believe there are many family caregivers who have talents and abilities that could really uh, advance the agenda. I know, of course, from a, a lot of contact with uh, uh, family caregivers over many years, uh, that there are many reasons that people cannot step forward, so it is the burden of care for their loved one or concerns about confidentiality, etc. But there are people, I know there are people out there who can do things. Maybe go, you know, looking for new members for the, the uh, Schizophrenia uh, Society of British Columbia. Uh, maybe people who, you know, don't feel that they can do uh, some of these tasks could step forward and uh, uh, maybe they've got accountancy skills and could do something like that or They've worked uh, in policy development and could help with document writing. Maybe some people have a research background. And goodness knows, uh, in the field of advocacy, having your facts right, having the right media and articles is uh, really helpful. So in a way, this is a call to you and to others that you may know to think about stepping forward and uh, doing something. And the goal being to see families more involved in the system and setting up the system. So in summary, the mental health system is broken. Unfortunately, as a realist, I have to say, and I really hope you will take this on board, that the services are actually going to get worse. And so our task is uh, significant, it's onerous, but um, I am an optimist. Psychiatrists, um, as a, an organization, as a profession, aren't going to solve those problems for you. Really, the system's going to get worse, and families have to become more visible. Um, people with lived experience often prevent individuals with uh, serious mental illness receiving treatment. Um, I think that's a controversial statement, but it's true, and I'm going to stand by it, and I'm happy to discuss this uh, at the end. Really, families uh, are the individuals who really care about people with severe mental illness, and so families are step forward as advocates and uh, guided by their own lived experience. Oops. So, questions and, uh, and answers. Well, I'm not sure about the, the answers, maybe more questions and discussion. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. O'Reilly. Yeah, that was an excellent presentation and you brought up so many valid points and I completely agree and we completely agree that families should and must be a part of the mental health system. But I also want to highlight that there's many psychiatrists that we work with that um, really do and care about the families and really include families in the entire process. So I hear what you're saying about family involvement. And now it's coming up with a way to improve the system where we have even more psychiatrists and more of the clinicians helping and supporting families and more families becoming increasingly visible, as you said. So thank you for all those points that you raised. Yeah. And just, I'm just going to just take a second, you can talk on. I'm yeah. just going to change the lighting because it looks, I don't know, it looks a bit dark, I think, yeah? Okay, yeah, it does. Thank you. That's that's good. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, and for everybody who is watching, we would love to hear your questions, so please do insert them. I know we have been receiving some. 
So if you have any questions at all for Dr. O'Reilly, please do put them in the Q&A box, the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, and we will get to the first question. Dr. O'Reilly, you said that increasing money is not necessarily the answer to improving the system, and that is because we do not prioritize severe and persistent mental illnesses. I'm curious, why do you think that is? Because um, uh, money uh, is politics. And um, if we, uh, um, each time, because more money has been poured into the uh, mental health system, but each time that happens, there are um, uh, competing agendas. So individuals, for example, um, my colleagues in uh, child psychiatry um, will lobby that they need more money. The pandemic has caused uh, difficulties for adolescents, people being isolated. Uh, there's a lot of online bullying, et cetera. And that's, uh, um, you know, that uh, resonates with a lot of people and resonates particularly with funders who are governments looking for votes. And so money goes to those areas, money goes to addiction, money goes to um, student health services and uh, uh, other services for people with mood disorders, first episode, low mood, etc. Uh, so it's a fight and um, not enough people are fighting for uh, money to go for those key services for people with uh, psychotic disorders. And there's always, it's, it's not a stigma. I don't think stigma is the problem. Um, there's an issue around, um, well, what, what sort of services we want. Uh, people must have read the, some people, the Globe yesterday, uh, were um, uh, Vipond, I think, Mr. Vipond was, uh, saying that we should you know, not be involuntarily hospitalizing people. So then, you know, that's uh, that we shouldn't have beds, you know, we don't have to uh, involuntarily hospitalize them. So you really have to have very clear voices coming out saying why that money should go to the most seriously mentally ill and to the services that are critical, such as ACT teams, inpatient beds, suitable housing, housing, not just, you know, uh, housing, but housing that can support people who have chronic psychotic illnesses. Psychiatrists can say that, but it's always seen as self-interest. Families say, say it, enough families say it, then politicians start to listen. The way they listen, for example, to the uh, AIDS community when they started lobbying or anti-retroviral uh, drugs. I, I still have an image of um, a group of mostly young men, it was maybe all young men, standing behind uh, our ex-Prime Minister, Mr. Cretium, shouting and demanding money for anti-retroviral drugs, which was a very successful campaign. I wanna, you touched on stigma, Dr. Riley, and I, I'd like you to expand on that. When you said that you don't feel that stigma is a factor, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts as to why stigma is not, I, because I found that surprising when you said that. Um, so you're recording this, which is interesting because, you know, maybe you'll run it back and say, <laughs> did he say that or did he not? Because I thought what I, I said, I think what I said was that it's not the problem uh, in terms of allocation of money. So there's a, there's a problem with, uh, um, with stigma. but. It, it's, I think it gets overplayed in the big picture of why, certainly of why we're not getting services for, for people with schizophrenia. And I think that some of the uh, proposed solutions to stigma are actually cause more problems. So for example, people have suggested we should do away with the words schizophrenia because it's stigmatizing, but, but we have to, that, that that's might as well say well let's let's pretend that this isn't a serious mental illness uh, so that's problematic um, and just there is a problem with stigma but it's not the problem that we're facing that's that's my that's my point another question that I have and somebody alluded to it in in the Q and a box as well is 
schizophrenia is not a rare illness. One out of 100 people have it. Three out of 100 people experience psychosis. So we're not talking about a rare illness that happens out there. All of us, majority of us would either be directly or indirectly affected by schizophrenia. So I just, I find it, and I find it very perplexing that we're even having this conversation with an illness where so many people are affected by it. Yes, well, um, it, you know, it's a good, it's a good question. Uh, I think one, one issue is that in the past, of course, people with schizophrenia uh, typically lived in institutions. They were out of sight, out of sight, out of mind. I think that that's still true to some extent that uh, um, individuals, you know, are tend to live with families, maybe not be as um, as involved in the community, and the Lions Club or this sort of thing, so people don't get uh, to to know them. This is an area where stigma actually possibly does come in that people don't discuss my the problems I'm having with my uh relative with schizophrenia or people not talking about their own schizophrenia if it's uh, if it's under under control um but it, you know it is it is a, a good question why when it's um not rare and people have had some experience of it um there's not more of an understanding but i can tell your you know uh, your member that there is not an understanding. So when I presented in Richmond Hill, uh, Manaki, who ran that uh, program, runs uh, Home on the Hill, uh, is a very political individual and got me to uh, had the local MPPs and local MP attend. And after the meeting, I met with them all on a Zoom meeting. It was just at the end of the uh, of COVID, and not one of them had an understanding of severe and persistent mental illness, even though they'd, they'd talked to Ms. Manaki, they'd been involved with her program, um, but they they did not grasp the nature of the problem. Wow. So Dr. Riley, if you had a magic wand, what would you do to change the system? And I know you talked about it in your presentation, but if we could do something to change the system, what do you think that would be? What, what could we do? So, so I don't think there's one element of the clinical services that could be changed that would um, completely radically alter the system, and it's very hard to change that. So, what I would do with my watch, magic wand would be uh, wave it and have every province in Ontario um, have family caregivers involved in the development of uh, mental health services and in overseeing those services and um, I think the trick in that would be to ensure that those were family caregivers who were representative of the body of individuals providing those services so in a province like British Columbia uh, the ministry should be obliged to go to your organization Okay, thank you. Okay, another question. We know that clinicians are overburdened and we also know that families are ready and willing to help. So how do you think, Dr. O'Reilly, that we can increase this collaboration with families within the BC mental health system? I know you've already touched on that, but just wondering if you have any further comments to that question. So I'm just, excuse me for yeah. thinking. So I think you're saying, how, how do we increase the collaboration with families and how do we get more family involvement within the BC mental health system? Yeah. So increasing collaboration. Um, I, I'm actually going to ask a question back before we before I address that. So I'm not I'm not stalling for time. I'm just thinking of uh, which parts of the system are similar to Ontario. So do, do you, in fact, have the difficulties that I'm talking about where people are discharged to homelessness, people are uh, discharged prematurely before there's a proper treatment plan, before they're actually, their symptoms are under control, and people aren't admitted when they clearly need and would benefit from 
acute inpatient treatment. Yes, I would say um, that does happen. As, as I talked about before, there's many clinicians who I know are fighting and really are advocating for the families and advocating for the people within the mental health system. So, but I would say yes, as a generalization, the answer would be yes, but I also know there's many clinicians who are doing their part to, to make yeah. changes. So I'm going to paraphrase your uh, response, Mr. Hodge, and say, you're telling me that there are excellent positions, but there are some that are not as good and um, don't you know, go the, the uh, 100% to ensure treatment. And in my talk at Richmond Hill, I laid out um, a scheme, a method for challenging that latter group of doctors, which is uh, respectful, but quite forceful. And um, uh, it's just a, a series of a way to communicate. Uh, so it's a, a you know, a, I guess a, a scheme for communication to challenge people who don't do what's uh, necessary. Uh, so people can look at that on the uh, on the uh, video. And if the schizophrenic uh, society BC wanted me to come back, we're interested in that and talk about development. I'd be happy to do that because I've been talking about that for. I don't know, 15 years or more. And I don't think anybody's systematically taken it up. Okay, well, thank you. I, yeah, can and, I, can and I just, can I just yeah. say on the other side, um, um, psychiatrists are human. And um, so they love, you know, like all humans, they love a bit of flattery and, and congratulations. So if you've got good doctors, then yes, you know, a letter from the British Columbia uh, BC, uh, so BC Schizophrenia Society saying our member said you provided great care to her brother. That's a that's a wonderful thing, you know. Copy the department's head. Copy the head of the university. We we forget how powerful our voices can be, and um, unsolicited um, uh, praise is very powerful. And actually, I see such. Uh, letters sometimes when I um, uh, assess people as an external um, reviewer for promotion. So some clinicians have these letters and put them in. They can be very powerful. Yeah, families have a very powerful voice. There's no doubt about it. And that's why we're having this event tonight because we need members and we need those family members to be a part of, uh, to be a part of BCSS and to be a part of the system. So yeah, thank you for that. Okay, next question. Uh, what can I do to help stop my son with schizoaffective disorder from going in and out of acute care? Why can't medical teams keep him medicated and on extended leave when he obviously needs and benefits from it? The human right of autonomy to refuse medication seems to become meaningless in the context of constantly reoccurring destructive relapses with mounting damage to his life. Okay, so I'm going straight back to my last answer. So that's a questioner. I would uh, ask you to look at the video uh, from Richmond Hill um, and consider using the approach that I suggested in the video to challenge the uh, clinicians and mental health teams who haven't done what sounds to be uh, absolutely essential to keep uh, to keep your relative well. Okay, yeah, thank you. And I just got a note here from the team saying, Dr. Riley, we only have five minutes left technically, so why don't we go a little bit over, but we also understand if people do have to leave, as long as that's okay with you, uh, Dr. Riley, if you don't mind sticking around for yeah, a little no, bit longer. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. happy to, to do that. Okay, thank you. So when are parents allowed to be a part of the system? And when can information be shared? And there's another question down below. You know, when we do talk about this, Dr. O'Reilly, is that why is it when a loved one has Alzheimer's, dementia, that the family is immediately called in? Or if an individual has type 1 diabetes and their son or daughter, and they, they show them how to, in, you know, inject insulin using an orange. So the family is an immediate part of the equation and part of that circle of care. So I think the question here is why, and I'll combine those two questions, is just when can information be shared with families and why is that information, do you think, not being shared with those family members? 
when it comes to severe and persistent mental illness? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's a it's an excellent question. Um, the so the the legislation that controls when information can be shared is provincial. So it's different in Ontario than it is uh, in British Columbia and Manitoba. Um, I'm not, um, you know, totally okay with uh, your legislation, but I actually think it's quite similar to, to ours. Um, so in Ontario, I'll just speak from an Ontario position. So information can be shared if the person, the patient, agrees to the sharing of the information. Um, uh, and if they don't, it still can be shared uh, in certain circumstances when there's uh, specific risks or dangers, or if the person is incapable of making the decision whether to share the information or not. Um, now, in my experience, um, this doesn't, ha- you know, often fails to happen when it's necessary. Um, however, I've found uh, that more often than not, the problem is not with the legislation, it's with the caregivers. So, for example, uh, at four o'clock, somebody's admitted to to the hospital with an acute schizophrenic relapse, and maybe that's overnight. And the next morning, let's say, uh, a relative calls in and says, "How's John doing? You know, uh, what's his diagnosis? We're really shocked at what's happened. What's you know the doctor going to do?" And they're typically told, "We can't share that." Because uh, you know the, you don't have permission, um, but the the nurse, a ward orderly, could walk down and ask the patients, "Do they mind sharing?" But they typically don't do that, and that's an ethos issue. It's just like, people don't think about it because they're they're sort of trains. You know, you must not release information, um, and even if John says, "Oh, I don't want you talking to my mother." Um, well, then the nurse should say, well, why not? <laughs> aren't, aren't you living at home, John? Um, I thought your mother was actually sort of you know, cooking for you and bringing it to the day center and, uh, uh, you know, making sure that your disability checks come in and you got uh, medication from the pharmacy, etc. And, you know, try to convince John to do it. And um, failing that, you know, in my practice sometimes I say is there something specific you don't want me to share with your family member maybe you know that information you told me about doing cocaine or those prostitutes or whatever it is and the person might say oh yeah that's the one you don't need to do that would you like to come in be there when we all talk together so you can hear what's going so it's it's at that level so I think um uh, clinical staff need better education about what they can do and what they should do. Mm-hmm. I, I've actually I've actually written a paper on this with uh, uh, Dr. John Gray, who knows also a member of the BCSS, and uh, um, Dr. Gray and myself could could share that, send it out because it's 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 sort of asking those same questions and talking a little bit about how we might address it. I have so many thoughts going through my head. So one of the questions is, as a clinician and as as a psychiatrist, Dr. O'Reilly, no, my first thought is as a family member and speaking on behalf of family members across across the province is, what do you do in those situations when your loved one doesn't want anything to do with you? When your loved one, because of the delusions, because of the hallucinations, may not want to acknowledge that you're even a family member. So what can we do in situations like that as our family members are dealing with their loved one who may not want to, number one, acknowledge they even exist and as a family member. And so number two, they're certainly not going to want their loved one being privy to that information that uh, they're gathering in, in the facility, in the designated psychiatric facility. So, so I'm going to take you up on you know, an exact question you asked me. So someone will not... Um, agree to sharing of information because of delusions, because of delusional beliefs. Um, if that's the case, the person isn't capable legally of making that decision. And certainly in Ontario, although this is is not used that often when it could be, uh, it is possible to proceed and um, share that information. 
so they declare that the person is incapable of making that decision and proceeding from there. Now, our system is um, somewhat different than yours about how you would uh, proceed, but here you would you know, go to the, the substitute decision maker to ask if information could be shared. And the substitute decision maker uh, of first call is usually a family member. Okay, thank you. And another point that I would be remiss if we didn't bring up anosognosia. It's getting mm -hmm. more and more attention. Thank goodness. We are increasing awareness about anosognosia, which as we all know is um, you lose insight into having an illness in the first place. So why would those individuals put up their hand and say, I need treatment when you do experience anosognosia? So what are your thoughts on that in terms of ways that we as an organization and as family members can increase awareness and make people become even more aware that anosognosia does exist? So, you know, the first thing I'm going to say is that, um, you know, I'm talking about lack of legal capacity. I'm talking about anosognosia. Um, we talk about lack of insight uh, as well. You know, it, it's, it's, the, the, the term, the word, has not had the impact that I think people thought it was going to have. Um, um, and I've got, I've, got very, I've got thoughts about that, I'm not, I'm not, but I'm not sure of the reason. One, it's a complex medical term. Uh, it's also hard to say. So <laughs> when you discuss it and so people in the media, the, you know. It's hard to spell. <laughs> yeah, it's even harder to spell. Yeah. Especially got a touch of dyslexia as I uh, but it but you know it's it's it doesn't quite resonate with the general public. Uh, so people you know write about it. So I'm not, I, I know uh, Susan Inman, who I think is probably on the uh, on the webinar, has has done this. But I I, I think people don't quite get it um, what it what it means. It's difficult to explain, and honestly. It's explaining something in words is completely different from experiencing it, from seeing it, having someone. And uh, I think that's, that's what brings meaning to you. And uh, one of the things, just you know, as a, an anecdote, um, one of the things I did in my first rotation uh, as a psychiatric trainee was sat down with a young man uh, for every morning for 20 minutes or you know, two or three times a week for 20 minutes and tried to talk him out of his delusions, you know, logically. And you do that and you, you really appreciate what's meant by an Thank you but, for that. But well, absent that, it's difficult. And, and that's why I tend to talk about capacity and insight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. With that word that's very difficult to say, pronounce, mm -hmm. and to spell. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And understand. <laughs> yeah, and understand. Good point. Okay, another question. For each of the four steps of assessing decision making capacity before giving consent for medical treatment, there seems to be deficiencies, difficulties in understanding, complex details, appreciating that it's relevant to self, comparing and weighing options, and communicating consistent communication. In the academic journals, there are useful screening tests, but emergency rooms tend to only use one, the MSC. How can we foster more standard screening for incapacity? Well, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I'm a little bowled over by the question because I just don't see it that way at all. I, I, I think uh, standard tests for uh, assessing capacity should be uh, left over for research projects. Um, the issue is a very simple issue. Does the person understand the information necessary to make a decision? So a decision about treatment, medication treatment. So. And then secondly, does the person appreciate the consequences basically of saying yes or no, of accepting the treatment or rejecting the treatment? So you know, are they are they, in fact, the test is, are they able to, are they able to understand and are they able to appreciate? Um, in the emergency room, in a hospital ward, uh, in an outpatient clinic, 
the doctor or other clinician can, can do that. They don't need another test, uh, a written test. A written test might be kind of paper test or, you know, a, a more complex breakdown. Might be helpful if you're concerned about going to court or going to review board, but I've spent my life going to review boards arguing this. And I, th I think, I, I think, you know, test just clouds the picture. Uh, and I'm happy to be cross-examined at length about why I think the person, the evidence I have that they don't understand or they don't appreciate. And for psychosis, it's mostly the second branch of the test. Okay. But don't you think we need some kind of, I'm gonna put on my journalist hat here. Don't you think we need some kind of system though, Dr. O'Reilly, just to ensure that we do have the proper mechanisms in place for advancing through those stages? No. Um, I, I'm, I'm, still, I'm saying no to a, to a pen and paper test or a specific test. What we need is people to really understand what the, what the test is. It's a simple test. Or is the person able to understand the information necessary to make the treatment decision? And are they able to appreciate the consequences of making that decision or not? And so I think we really need to hammer that home. Um, if you start making it complex and people start thinking they can't do it or that it, there's some magic to it or something. Okay, thank you. Another question. I believe at the heart of this huge failure in our system or needing to improve our system is the lack of oversight and accountability. We need to reallocate or revamp our funding models. Money is being poured in in so many different directions, which it leaves nothing left for people with serious and persistent mental illnesses. So my question is, what do you see is the most effective way to ensure accountability within this system? And how can we focus our advocacy for accountability and greater insight or oversight? So this is the core message of my presentation. Family members um, should, should insist on being at every table where there is development of mental health policy, um, uh, distribution of funds, uh, and monitoring of the performance of the mental health system. This also ties into money and funding. Why does Canada spend less than European countries on mental health services? I, I can't answer that, sorry. We need, we need your magic wand. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you have to, to admit you just like, I can't answer that. Then why do we not do it? So. Fair, fair enough. Um, Obviously, as we heard, uh, and from your accent, Dr. O'Reilly, that you were not born and raised in Canada, and you've done extensive travel, and you did your education other locations. So what have you learned about the mental health systems in other countries that we could learn here, or maybe even adopt here in this country? So, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a little flippant. Um, um, because I've, I've said this in other settings, I've been sort of said this spontaneously um, about Ontario. That I've, I've worked in Ireland and uh, uh, I've worked in, as a psychiatrist and in Saskatchewan. Um, and Ontario is by far the worst system I've worked in, uh, which is a sad, a sad thing. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think you've got some special problems in British Columbia, particularly in Vancouver. Um, I, I, I suspect your system is provides somewhat better care than Ontario. You might not want to hear that, but that's that's my overall impression. Um, so why why does Ireland do better? I think because it's it's less polarized um, as was. Saskatchewan was a, a small, friendly, somewhat inward looking province, but it was really concerned about its, uh, its population. And you couldn't get away with nonsense. You couldn't say, you know, we should ban involuntary uh, hospitalization because it's a terrible thing. 
that that would just, it just went nowhere. But in Ontario, and maybe not in British Columbia as well, um, you know, people are saying things and in, in society in general, as you, as you know, we are more polarized. People are saying things that, you know, are just nonsense and nobody's like the person next to them isn't correcting them. And so it's, it's allowed to go. So in Ireland, people would have said, look, we've got to do something about this problem. And their system is deteriorating as well. I don't know if that's good news or bad news, reassuring or not, but it's uh, but it's still, I think, better than significantly better than Ontario. Okay, thank you for that. And I know we're running out of time here and we still have a lot of questions, but this is this is a valid one, and I'm sure this is one on many of our minds. Addiction services appear to dominate the field. And now I feel that I have to fight to bring attention to those with severe mental illness who are not addicted or do not use drugs or alcohol. I feel that I'm in the minority. What are your comments about this observation? Um, well, it it's echoes what I said earlier. It's uh, about why adding more money to the system isn't going to be the solution to the problems that I listed. And there are other problems with uh, providing services to severe People with severe and persistent mental illness. So it's a fight, it's a battle. And so uh, the question is absolutely right. At the moment, um, addiction uh, is, you know, is a very newsworthy item, and addiction services are getting more money. Uh, what's the solution? It's, it's got to be more, it's got to be more family members stepping forward. So, you know, I, I'm saying the same thing over and over again. So, you know, um, Maybe that goes back to my, my quote. So I gotta stand back a little bit and say, you know, if you're hearing this over and over again, the real question then is, what are we gonna do? Are, are, are people gonna, who are on the call tonight, on the webinar, gonna take it seriously? Are they interested in moving forward? What would they, what would they do? How could that agenda be advanced? Well, that's the, the issue. And we're getting, it's getting late, so we're not going to do that. But, you know, if, if, if I could help or maybe myself and some of my colleagues from British Columbia um, get together, talk about this. Could we advance? Uh, uh, well, could we align to do that? So I'd be more than happy to be involved. Thank you. A nice segue into our last question. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So apologies if we didn't get to your question. Um, but um, Dr. O'Reilly, we talked a lot tonight about increasing awareness. We covered a tremendous number of topics and we could have had another two hours for this webinar. But how do we get our message out to the media and the general public? And the question doesn't specify in what area. So I'll just add my two cents, both in terms of severe and persistent mental illness. What is it? The effects of it, the effects on our family, the effects on our um, on our healthcare system, on our clinicians, but also what we can do, what we can do as a population to address this illness that is not rare. So with the, you know, with the media and the general public, I think you uh, have to go to the media to get to the general public. And um, I think that we have fields to do some things that we could do. So um, many, many journalists are, are quite sympathetic. Uh, and I think that nationally, we should have an organization that uh, that's tracks these journalists and have um, family members who contact them and you know, talk to them and supply them with uh, information and in that way encourage them to uh, to do things uh, that will be positive. The model I'm suggesting is is very similar to what the Treatment Advocacy Centre uh, did. So uh, Fuller Tory told me that he you know, kept a list of journalists who was interested in this area and would you know, organise so technologically so that they could uh, keep in touch with these journalists, send them articles, research articles, uh, um, other media stories, etc. And 
Like, how would you do that? Well, you need, you need an organization, but you need somebody and some people to actually do that, to monitor newspapers, to see who's doing that. So that's what my appeal is. I think lots of individual family caregivers could add to this under an appropriate umbrella. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I look forward to the day when we as a society can lean in when we hear that somebody has schizophrenia or when a family member has their brother, their sibling, their husband, their partner, their daughter, their aunt has schizophrenia. And when I look forward to the day, and hopefully it happens in our lifetime, when we as a society can lean into those individuals rather than leaning out. And we see it time and time and time again with every other illness, people lean in and you know, do everything they can to support them. And when it comes to schizophrenia, it seems to be quite the opposite. So I look forward to the day, Dr. O'Reilly, when we no longer have to have these conversations and we can improve, continue to improve our system and work together to make that happen. So thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your time and thank you for all of your insight. And it really was a very valuable conversation. So thank you for that. Thank you. And again, it was uh, it's, it's, it's my honor to be here. And uh, I do again salute the uh, Schizophrenia Society for this wonderful work to do. Thank you very much. And I just, before we go, I just want to give a huge shout out to the team right across the province, all the regional managers, all the educators. Thank you for everything that you do. Couldn't do this without you. We need you. So thank you to the entire team across the province, to the provincial office team. Once again, couldn't do this without you. We are in this together. And I am just so honored and so grateful for the team that I get to work with every day. And also to the board members, to the society board, to the foundation board, who are all volunteers and volunteer their time endlessly to support BCSS and our families right across the province. So thank you to you all. BCSS, you have my word, we'll continue doing everything we can to increase awareness about this illness and to do what we can to move that dial with a, right across the province in every single community, not just Vancouver, not just the larger centers of Prince George or Kelowna, but the right across every single community across this province. Thank you to you for being a BCSS member. If you are not a member, if your loved ones are not a member, please sign them up. We need a louder voice and that can happen through you and your loved one or family and friends becoming BCSS members. With all of us working together, we truly can make a difference. So thank you for sharing your time with me tonight. There will be a survey at the end, so please take the time to fill it out. And uh, hopefully we can just continue to improve and grow and just become stronger and better as an organization and as you know, a group together trying to make changes within the system. So Thank you very much for being here. And I just really want to give a final shout out to AA Pharma for your generous support of this event tonight. And uh, thank you again. And I salute all of the BC, the BC families that um, are supporting a loved one with a severe and persistent mental illness. So all the best. Thank you for being here. And we will talk soon. Take care. <laughs>